we're going to move straight on to our, our next speaker, Alexandra the, from Gameloft. Uh, talking about 20 years of mobile gaming, as somebody who's been around that long myself, um, I remember the earliest kind of uh, deals that we did with Gameloft back in the day uh, when it was Java mobile devices. In fact, I remember when Christian uh, um, was doing AMA, um, when he launched, uh, we had, I think we had um, Prince of Persia on Java at the same time as AMA did their first, it was basically like a cosmopolitan magazine um, uh, uh, quiz type thing. It was the first non-game app we ever launched. And it was funny how that was higher so the, the, the Cosmo quiz was number one and the Prince of Persia was two, as I recall. But that's a long time ago. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm one for spending too much time indulging myself in the past. So I, don't know, uh, I will leave it to you. Over to you, sir. Thank, thanks, Oscar. Hello, everyone. Um, today is, yeah, we're going to do a bit of a travel in the past. Um, Gameloft is uh, celebrating its 20th anniversary. And uh, we were asked by a Pocket Gamer to give some insight on those last 20 years. So there's gonna be a bit of a retro gaming in the next uh, 20 minutes. I'm gonna share my presentation and I'm very happy to be there and uh, hope this will be interesting for, for all of you. So let me share my screen. There you go. So, um, oops, yep. Uh, I'm Alexander de Rochefort, I'm CFO of Gameloft, have been since the creation of the company back in 2000, so I've been in, in mobile gaming for 20 years. And today the topic is to do 20 years of mobile gaming in 20 minutes. It's not going to be easy, but we're going to try to do this. We're going to look back at two decades in mobile games from the really very, very beginning as Gameloft was part of the pioneers in this uh, industry. Um, to the situation today and, and very quickly how we see the future. Um, so uh, let's start with mobile gaming in the early 2000s. The, the reason why we created Gameloft uh, back in April 2000 was that um, the install base of consoles uh, seemed quite low compared to what we believed was the actual uh, potential of a mobile gaming market, uh, of gaming market as a whole. Um, back in the days in 2000, the install base total of console was uh, seven, 170 million, uh, with the PS1 leading the pack with something like 70, 76 million units installed based and, and followed by the Game Boy at 54. But we at Gameloft, and that was really the reason for creating the company, we believe that the video game had a, a much, much wider um, uh, potential than just 170 million people across the globe. And what better way to reach a better audience, a higher, a bigger audience than, than using mobile phones? Um, of course, uh, now it seems obvious, but at the time it was a, really a crazy bet uh, made by, by Gameloft because the phones were very, very basics. Um, but the idea was there to say, okay, video game is, um, has a really a global uh, can have a global reach and, and today the consoles are too expensive or uh, at least with 170 million, we're not reaching the full potential. This is really what guided the people behind Gameloft at the time in 2000 and uh, the idea. So we, we created this as a pure mobile gaming company. Um, we started probably too early. Um, 2000 was technology from a technical point of view, uh, technological point of view, a bit early to start uh, gaming uh, on mobile. Uh, the only games that we could do were based on the WAP technology. So between 2000 and 2002, we created a um, few dozens, well, a couple of three, three dozens of, of, of games on, on WAP. And WAP was essentially a technology that allowed you to do browser-based gaming. Um, but a very basic experience uh, as a browser gaming on your mobile. Um, and so clearly the, the company um, had a rough time during those two, three years, first three years, because the market simply wasn't there. Uh, the technology wasn't there. We, we kept on going though, uh, and, and, uh, and kudos to our, to our shareholders at, at the time who 
continue to believe in the company, even though our revenues and uh, we're, we're not really flying, uh, going anywhere. Uh, but we, 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 we continued on. And uh, by the second half of 2002, we had um, very good news coming from Siemens and Nokia at the time. Uh, they were the first to integrate uh, the Java technology in their mobile phones, which allowed us suddenly um, to get to a next level from a, a gaming point of view on mobile phones. So beginning of 2003 is really where the story begins for Gameloft as a mobile gaming company. With the Java technology integrated in the phones, we were able to really create um, action games, uh, not browser-based games. So games that you could download on your phone for one to three dollars, between one and three dollars, depending on the countries or type of games. We're selling those games uh, through um, the uh, carriers and handset manufacturers, and our revenues really boomed. So we, we went from zero revenue, close to zero in 2002, um, to just, just under um, 100 million euros of revenues uh, in 2007. So this really uh, uh, marks the start of Gameloft as a company and, and of the industry, really, of the mobile gaming industry. Uh, for me, the real beginning is, is, is uh, end of 2002, beginning of 2003, when Siemens and Nokia start shipping um, their first uh, Java-enabled phones. Um, and at this time, so Gameloft was one of the pioneers, but there were others with us. I remember very well Jamdat being our number one competitor at the time, but you had Andy Games, IOMO, et cetera, et cetera. Quite a few, not that many, but quite a few. A uh, few that still exist today, which is uh, shows how difficult this market is and how um, important it's been to, to adapt to this ever-changing market conditions. Um, so the type of games we're doing would, would look like this. Um, this will bring back memories to some of you. Uh, to others of you, this will bring cries of horror at looking at those games. But actually, at the time, it, it was pretty cool for us. I mean, coming from web games to the Java games, the experience seemed really incredible. I, I, I for one, had a really nice experiences, game experiences. I recall very nice game experiences on, on the Nokia 3110, uh, 3510, uh, and on the clamshell phones. So here you see a rapid evolution. We went, and the technology evolved very rapidly from then on. We went from black and white tiny screens on the Siemens M50. Uh, then the color screens were introduced, if I remember well, by Nokia. At least the 3510 was very successful phones, which, um, which made uh, color screens more uh, popular. Uh, then the clamshell phones arrived. Uh, with the Sharp, Motorola, of course, Motorola became number one handset manufacturer. So these guys, the manufacturers and the uh, uh, telecom operators were uh, our number one uh, partners during those years from 2002 to 2008. Uh, Gameloft was working almost exclusively with uh, handset manufacturers. So the big guys we were talking to, really the big meetings for us were meetings with Nokia, Siemens, Motorola, and the big meetings with, uh, uh, on the uh, um, carrier side, uh, telecom operators were people at Verizon, uh, Vodafone, etc. So um, this has changed a lot since then. Um, but these were uh, the people that were making um, gaming on mobile phones a reality. And in fact, I mean, as you can see here on the screen, uh, the evolution of gaming was quite rapid and, and uh, quite exciting for us as a company. Um, so you have a few examples. Uh, by, by 2004, we were al already experimenting simile 3D on, on, on clamshell phones on the LG 8000. Um, so the market grew quite fast because the technology was getting way better. Uh, here by 2005, we had 38 million mobile players and the industry uh, was 1.8 billion. So it was uh, quite, uh, quite significant for, for us. I mean, give, keep in mind that we started from close to zero uh, at the end of 2002. Uh, and uh, you can see here at the time, what was the expectations from the uh, market studies, which uh, were probably 
uh, below reality after that. Uh, but clearly, by 2005, we were becoming a real something to notice. Uh, the industry, the mobile gaming industry, was already becoming something to notice in the video, video game space as a whole, even though we were representing only a small part of the, of the total industry. Uh, so you, you may ask yourself, what was the market looking at from a, uh, from a development and, and consumer perspective at the time? It was very, very, very different from what we see today. Um, Gameloft uh, and its competitors, we, our goal was to release as many games as possible. The, um, you would play a game, I mean, the game had a, uh, a finite um, gaming time. You, you could only play the game for two, three, four, five hours, let's say six hours, after which you were, you, were, you were pretty much finished with the game. So of course, for developers, the goal was to launch as many games as possible to make sure that people, uh, the next game that people would uh, download would be one of your games. So at the time, I remember Gameloft would release between uh, 35 to 50 games, pretty high quality games, uh, according to the uh, current standards at the time, uh, 35 to 50 games per year. Um, and we grew our staff from 100 people at the beginning of 2003 uh, to 4,000 people at the end of, of 2007. So the increase in headcount was, was massive and crazy, uh, but we needed all those people to release 50 games per year. And we were always, always striving to go for high quality. So we needed uh, a lot of people um, and uh, we also needed a lot of um, hands to adapt the game to an increasing number of handsets we need to develop on. The, the level of fragmentation was insane and, uh, and we had uh, to hire a lot of people, uh, especially in, in our studios in Asia, to do, do QA and porting a deployment of our games, of our 50 games on thousands of different handsets. So that was one of the big, uh, if not the major buyers of entry in our industry is that the fragmentation was insane and you needed to develop a lot of different games. The players were really discovering mobile games uh, at the time. So, um, they were, they were uh, very open and, and, and they're still very uh, candid in the way they were receiving the games. Uh, I remember, uh, and, and the guys at Pocket Gamer, uh, uh, Oscar was, was mentioning it. I mean, we have very fond memories of those times where uh, consumers uh, were probably less cynical than they are today and, and receiving all those new games with amazement. Each new game represent you know, uh, replacing the previous one with new features, new, new exciting things. Every, every, every game added something quite new uh, because the phones were evolving quite rapidly. Um, so very exciting times. Um, there were, our, our marketing budget was close to zero. So there was no UA, there was no CPI whatsoever. Uh, our sales team's uh, goal was to um, be uh, as close as possible, as friends as possible with um, the telecom operators uh, to convince them to push forward our games uh, like featuring uh, on their own platforms um, for our games to be put forward. So we would pitch the game to the telecom operators, show them how good the game was, uh, how it would change the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, quite different from, from today. And uh, well, the games were sold for one to three dollars. It was a paper download and there was no ads in the games. Um, then of course, July 2008 is the turning point of the industry. As you know, uh, it's the launch of the App Store uh, in July 2008, quickly followed by Google Play uh, in October and quickly followed by Amazon, Facebook and uh, a lot of other digital, digital fronts, uh, storefronts, uh, including uh, of course, Microsoft, etc. Um, so this really, as you know, marks a major change for the industry. Um, Apple, Google took away, in a sense, the market from the handset manufacturers and uh, from um, especially the telecom operators. So a company like Gameloft was generating 90% of its revenues at the time through telecom operators. Today, we generate around, we still generate, uh, but it's only 15% of our revenues that we generate 
via telecom operators. And we do this especially in, um, in uh, developing countries like uh, and areas, so Latin America, parts, parts of Asia and, and, uh, and uh, Middle East and Africa. Um, and, but the rest is done with uh, stores, uh, OTT stores, and especially Apple and Google. So this really marked a major change. Um, this is how our game started to look. So if you keep in mind the games that we showed a few minutes ago, you can see uh, the step up. Uh, these are a few screenshots uh, of the first Game Love games uh, on uh, the first iPhones and Android phones back in 2008, 2009. And so Asphalt 5, Nova, uh, Modern Combat, Zombie Infection, and many more uh, were really uh, uh, pushing the boundaries of these phones, but we were able to do uh, games that were uh, full 3D games um, on which you had PvP, uh, on which you had social uh, interactions, uh, you had the accelerometer, you had touch screens. It was really a tot totally different uh, game. Our Java games, um, in terms of size, uh, were between uh, towards the end, we were talking of a few hundred kilobytes um, with the advent of the, of the iPhone and, and Android phones, we started doing games of several megabytes. And, and today, a game like Asphalt 9, um, fully, fully downloaded, is probably between one and two gigabytes. Um, so you can, you can measure the, the, uh, the long path that we, we've gone through uh, and of course, the main difficulty here was to adapt our teams, uh, for our teams to adapt from uh, 2D Java games of a few hundred kilobytes uh, to uh, full-fledged 3D PvP uh, online games um, weighing one gigabyte. So uh, really our teams were incredible during those years because we adapted quite well. And as you know, Game Love Story has been uh, up to a couple of years ago only through uh, organic growth. So we didn't buy any studios. We just created those studios from scratch in different locations. Today we have uh, something like 17 different studios across the globe, um, which has always been the case. We've always tried to have studios uh, located across the, the, the world. So yeah, 2008 is really uh, about evolving technology, uh, but also about evolving business model. We went from selling games for one to two uh, euros to selling games for five to 10 euros. Uh, and then in 2012, which is another big bang for our industry, as you know, uh, with the, um, the uh, advent, advent of, of, um, of the free to play model and uh, changing monetization. So this is probably to my, my experience is that um, the change from the uh, paper download model to the free to play download is, a, is a, uh, as big as a, of a change as, as a, the app store and the smartphones were for our industry uh, because um, the promise we made to ourselves back in 2000 was only fully, fully realized with the advent of, of free to play because with the advent of free to play, suddenly we accessed uh, global uh, audiences of uh, hundreds of millions of people. Um, so with the advent of free to play, uh, with the fact that the games were distributed freely, uh, it changed everything in the market. It changed the way we were creating the games, the way we were thinking the monetization of the games, but it changed the demographics of the industry, uh, it changed the tastes, uh, and it changed the development standards. Uh, and of course, at the end of the day, it changed the market size. Um, so we have games now that have been downloaded almost 1 billion, 1 billion times. Um, Disney, uh, sorry, uh, Million Rush by Gameloft uh, is about or has reached uh, a billion players across uh, the globe. Um, today in 2019, we, we can also uh, see how far we've got. Uh, mobile gaming is a $68 billion industry. It's been driving the growth of the video game market for the last few years. We have uh, estimated 2.5 billion video game players across the, the world, most of which play on, on mobile phones. So uh, the promise we, we made ourselves uh, 20 years ago is, is fulfilled. 
Uh, and today, yeah, mobile is the number one segment in the video game space and one of the fastest growing segment within this space. Uh, from a geographical point of view, it's Asia, which in the past few years uh, has been driving the growth of the mobile gaming market. Of course, the numbers here that I show uh, show exactly the country, uh, but 2019 was quite a special year for, uh, um, for Asia. Um, but overall, if you look back at the last uh, four or five years, clearly Asia Pacific have been uh, fueling most of the growth, a lot of the growth of the video game market and a lot of the growth of the, of the, of the mobile gaming market. It is now the number one region uh, in the world uh, by far, 72 billion versus uh, 40 for uh, US, etc. Um, now, if we, if we look uh, at Gameloft and, and the industry uh, in the future, uh, we clearly think at Game Love that mobile gaming is today at a crossroad. We, we can see uh, very different trends um, and uh, contradicting trends uh, emerging. Um, of course, there's the free to play model, which is the dominant uh, model today, um, which appeared in 2011, which has allowed, I was saying, uh, the audience to just multiply uh, exponentially in the last couple of, in the last few years. This free-to-play model is still the dominant model. It's based on in-app purchases and ads. Uh, it has high barriers to entry in the sense that you need significant UA budgets and the metagame complexity makes it difficult for newcomers um, to penetrate and to be successful in this market. It's, we, we have become extremely complex organizations uh, compared Gameloft in 2020 compared to Gameloft in 2005 is a very, very different uh, beast. Uh, we have like all players we in the industry, but we have uh, people specialized in user acquisition, uh, data scientists, psychologists, etc., etc. which of course we, we the, the life, our life was a bit simpler back in the days, back in 2005. But of course, the market is, is way, way bigger and the, uh, um, the, um, the challenge is, is, is way, way, way more significant. Um, and today, yeah, in free to play, monetization and user acquisitions are, are key. Then in the past two years, we've seen the uh, hyper casual um, uh, tsunami uh, take over a significant uh, portion of the, of the market. Um, there was a study by my tower sensor showing that 80%, 80% of last year's download were uh, related to uh, hyper casual games. Um, so it is really taking the market by storm. Um, it's uh, allowed new players to enter the market and to be uh, very successful. And uh, it is a very different market and, and, and way of thinking uh, mobile gaming than the uh, free to play we've known so far. So these are 100% ad based uh, games for for most of them, uh, the barriers of entry are, are to entry are lower. Uh, you have tens of thousands of games available. They're developed in a, a few weeks, um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, try and, and fail, uh, trial and error um, in the in the, in the way they develop those those games. Uh, user acquisition is of course key, and 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 the ability to buy with uh, uh, those users with extremely low CPIs is also key. And then you have a, a, another uh, trend which has been extremely successful for uh, the movie industry and for uh, the music industry and which so far has not taken fully in, the, in our market, which is the subscription uh, business model with, uh, with Apple Arcade uh, leading the pack for the moment, uh, of course, with Microsoft on console, but on mobile, uh, Apple is really leading the pack in terms of trying and develop a new business model by a subscription, no ads, no in-app purchases. Uh, Apple contributes to the development cost of the developers today. There were 100 games at launch. I think they're, they're probably close, getting closer to 200 today. Uh, content is highly curated and uh, potentially there's little or no acquisition, at least today, on those, uh, on those models. Um, so there's conflict between those three uh, models. I don't know which one will uh, prevail. Uh, I wish I could tell uh, for sure, but 
uh, clearly um, these three uh, are, are competing head to head against each other. Um, we strongly believe at Gameloft in the subscription model going forward, um, given, and that's why we've been partner with uh, Apple since the first day on the Apple Arcade. Um, we're, we're, we're looking at other uh, business models, uh, other ways to uh, push forward uh, subscription within our games um, without the help of Apple or Google. Um, it's clearly worked extremely well for the music industry. Uh, and this, there's, there's something to, to look into. Why am I saying this is that, um, uh, going back to the last point, uh, I probably won't have time to go on, on, on you know, what's, what's next from the technological point of view uh, on uh, 5G and, and, uh, and, um, and the cloud gaming, et cetera. But uh, if, we, if we spend just the last few minutes on the, on the business model, I think today we have a broken business model in the industry and I'm quite personally concerned about this. Um, we, I mean, we, we give as companies, we, 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 we have a um, payback of 30% to Apple, Google and the uh, platforms. Um, and, and these 30% are, uh, uh, initially uh, meant to uh, account for uh, the downloads that those platforms are bringing to the games that are uh, featured or that are just included in, in, in the stores. Uh, on top of that, uh, many games um, pay uh, royalties to IP owners uh, uh, because you use uh, third-party IPs for, for your games. Um, and, and this model worked quite well uh, until recently when, uh, as I was saying, in the free-to-play model, user acquisition has become uh, absolutely essential and a, and a key part of the success of a game, um, which means that the uh, business model is becoming uh, quite broken because on top of the 30% you pay uh, to Apple and Google, which was meant to pay for uh, the hosting of the game, um, the billing of the game, and of course the uh, fact that um, um, these um, platforms were bringing you a lot of users, um, uh, you were able not to pay anything else in terms of marketing. Gameloft has spent uh, less than 5% of its revenues in marketing for many years until now with the latest change in the advent of free-to-play. Um, we've had like uh, our competitors uh, and, and the whole market, we spend an increasing uh, part of our revenues in uh, user acquisition on top of the 30%. So the 30% um, revenue share that we give to uh, the OTT platforms has not moved. Uh, but on top of that, we've added 30% uh, of uh, gross revenues uh, for most companies in the space. Uh, they spend 20, 30% of their revenues um, buying users, buying downloads, on top of the 30% we they already pay. So in total, uh, when you receive, when, when users uh, pay $100, uh, spend $100 on, on a game, at the end of the day, um, taking into account the uh, OTT revenue share of 30%, taking into account royalties that you may have to pay on, a, on an IP, third party IP of let's say 20% and taking 30% uh, uh, of gross revenues paid spent in UA, you've got you've got $26 left as a company left to pay for uh, your production and all of your SGNA. Um, and so the companies which have uh, benefited and most benefited from uh, mobile gaming from my point of view in the last few years have been uh, Facebook, Google, uh, and uh, some of the uh, ad companies which um, take a lot of money from uh, from the UA. Uh, spending. So that's a, a real concern. At Gameloft, we, uh, that's why we're looking really into uh, the sub subscription model. Um, we're also looking at diversifying our revenues. Um, we've, we've launched Asphalt 9 on console recently. It's been a huge success on the Switch, still is. Uh, it's actually uh, making more money today than it was uh, three months ago or six months ago or nine months ago. Uh, so we'll take a lot of our games in the future to the console. Uh, we've always strived to be at the you know, forefront of technology on the phones. And uh, we think we can bring this experience on free to play to console.
Back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. That's uh, awesome. I, I think the, the, that thing you were just saying about kind of you're always being trying to produce the best quality content on the best platforms. And we've had a few kind of like, um, you know, full starts along the way. I remember the Engage, I remember, you know, Gizmondo and things like that. But I think what you've always tried to do is bring this superb quality to games. Uh, and now, unfortunately, we haven't got much time. I am, um, I, I mean, the one thing I, I, I would just say is like, can you imagine? you know, 20 years ago when we were talking about, you know, mobile games, that we would ever see a point where mobile games was the biggest sector in the games industry. I, I, I still to this day have to pinch myself. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, I, I want to wear the t-shirt saying, we told you so. <laughs> but uh, that's obviously the pain and, and stress that's gone to, through that. Um, I'd love to, just one, one question I think we've got time for is, um, is if there was one game you would be most proud of that Game Loft would produce, which game would it be? Um, I think I have two games in mind, but I have to give only <laughs> one. Uh, I, I would say uh, it's uh, I would say it's uh, uh, Minion Rush, hmm. um, created back in in uh, in 2014, June 2014, uh, because it's the fifth or sixth most downloaded game in the history of video games. Uh, for a small company like Gameloft uh, to be there in the top 10 most downloaded is, is I mean, going back to when the company was created, uh, a few a few people uh, in Paris, uh, that just seems incredible. Yeah, I, 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 Elosha has just commented in the Q&A section, <laughs> Minion Rush Rocks, which is quite right too. Uh, on that note, thank you so much for taking your time out and uh, definitely taking me on a, on a uh, journey back in, in my past. Uh, and it's been an amazing journey for you guys. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thanks everyone. Yeah, Bye.